Hey there, and welcome back to Hold and Modify, YouTube's most poorly produced, underproduced Amiga channel, and it's Q again. Today we're dragging out the 4000. Why? I think it's jealous of the Amiga 3000, the old uh, always boots Amiga 3000. 4000's always kind of had some problems booting up, but I think we might have finally figured it out. Last time Dr. Chris was here, we did some uh, tinkering, and I think maybe, just maybe, always boots 4000? All right, so as you can see, uh, I gotta open this all up. You know, it's you spend all that time carefully putting things in there, and as you can see, I've got some interesting things going on with monitor stand issues. Uh, hot tip, everybody, always buy a center stand monitor for computers or whatever, even TV sets. These ones where they're on the side like this, this is a nightmare. This is not what you wanna do. This is terrible. Um, I hate this. That's why I have this kind of Amiga soft, yes, I'm using uh, the, the precursor to the original Lightwave as a monitor stand. Please, please send the hate letters. I appreciate it. Uh, image effects, sorry. Actually, you know what? You're not being used as a monitor stand. You're just sitting there for, uh, you know, advertising. There you go, image effects. Give, give me some advertising. There's a little Mr. Lemming. I'm gonna have to, yeah, pull all this apart and uh, open it up so I can get to what I wanna show you. It's the gotta go fast. Memory expansion card, the basically the modern version of the Zorro 3 memory expansion card for Amigas uh, with, uh, you know, Zorro 3. Does this work in Zorro 2? Leave a message in the comments. I don't think it does. I think it's required Zorro 3. And it can go into the 4000 and the 3000. I've got two of these, and they got to go faster, guys, who designed this board and everything. This one was put together by our, our good friend, Kazanovs, right here. Uh, Kevin on 64, actually. If you see my old uh, BFG video, uh, I did one where you get to see the BFG video with the L60, and that's actually what's in this 4000 right now. So, cool thing is, we're gonna slap in another 256 megs of memory into this 4000. Q, why on earth would you put another 256 megs in here when you've already got 128 megs? Well, believe it or not, back in the day, and the reason that big, big, huge Zorro 3 Fastlane card existed, a lot of 2D artists who did print work, like magazine cover work or video game art box work, they would have to do these huge, you know, print size, mega DPI prints. And the Amiga software at the time could actually have those things loaded in memory and it would just pan around the image. Like you couldn't display the whole image obviously on the Amiga, but you could pan around the image and uh, you need all that memory space to do that. And of course, the other reason you'd want gargantuan amounts of RAM is if you're doing audio work and you need to do really long samples or multiple layers of sampling and audio samples, those things can fill up memory really huge. And you gotta record them into memory and then write them to hard drive with some of those programs. And then of course, my big reason, Lightwave, all right? If you wanna load up really huge Lightwave scenes, especially ones that were designed in the early PC era, the Windows era, and bring them back to the Amiga, you need the memory. And I'm really looking forward to hopefully loading up the original Voyager model from the show, the actual digital production model that was used. I wanna get it up here on this uh, 4000, and eventually the 3000, because I've got two of these cards. So that's my excuse for why on earth would you wanna have this much memory in an Amiga. But let's go ahead, uh, enough of me ranting about why, let's get into here so I can talk about this, uh, you see down here, this little DVD drive, which is now filling that hole that's been vacant for so long. All right, so you're gonna see a really long IDE cable here. This is part of the mystery and the magic. This 4000 had a very, very small IDE cable, and the issue was I was letting the cable that was easiest to use plug into the things where it needed to go. So I wasn't actually using the, the last cable. I was using the middle and just kind of like saying, okay, thank you. And what was happening, it was going out looking for the other device that should be connected and it wasn't there. And it was just random. It would like fire off and go looking for the device to the left and the ribbon wasn't there. Go look to the right, wasn't there. And then every now and then it would actually hit the one that it was plugged into, the middle ribbon, and it would boot. That's why the 4000, I have to push the, the boot. You know, I'd have to turn on and off like multiple times because it just wasn't finding the hard drive. Uh, you know, okay, well then just, you know, use the right ribbon, man. What do you, what's, what's the big deal? Just plug it into the end. Yeah, and that's actually what we're doing right now is it's plugged in using the really short ribbon that it came with, as you can see. It's plugged in using the last 
last in the chain and that's what you want but i want to have this cd drive here because it looks cool and i can actually use it now and then the problem is this short little guy in order to get it plugged in over here you think well here you go just plug it in let's bring it down here and plug it no that's not longer you also need to twist it <laughs> it has to be twisted and to do that twist it's just not long enough so i needed a super super long cable so if you look here this big mess i mean it's actually a little longer so i could use i might actually be able to twist this to get it to go to the cd-rom drive and it'll work however as long as you use one termination end of this i could reverse this instead of plugging this into the motherboard and having to deal with this the short twist to get over to the drive i could put the short end into the motherboard plug this into the hard drive and now i've got all the space in the world to twist this cable however i need it to go into the cd-rom drive all right so we got that plugged into the board now we just come down here and plug this back into the hard drive it's the new cable virgin cable so it's very stiff to go red strip red stripe to the right but now we have all this space oh look at that go ahead and push her back in we're not going to do a full button up here because you know that's would be the worst thing in the world to try and do right now until we confirm that any, everything's working. What we're looking for is lights on the hard drive here. Low, high, hard drive light is on solid, which probably means I have a cable in backwards. CD-ROM drive opens. But yeah, we get the solid light. Oh wait, there it goes, now it's booting. Oh, okay, I guess it was doing some kind of IDE detect. I just needed to be patient. <laughs> oh, Q, just be patient. Well, there you go. It looks like it booted. We can't tell because I have nothing plugged into it. But yeah, the hard drive light's going and uh, all seems to be well. Yay! And we'll go ahead and do our little uh, tuck here. What is Taiwanese tuck? What is that word? Okay. So we'll put that down there. Okay, that's out of the way. Epic cooling for the O60 is in. And yeah, of course, now we get to the really and truly amazing, exciting part putting in this memory card, which goes one way. It says front, all right? Make sure you look at that. It says front, front. Otherwise it'll explode and you'll be very upset. Let's just put it here for now because this is reachable and easy. My God, that's incredible. Alrighty then, we're not gonna put the case on. No, 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 never do that. Let's turn it on. Always boots 4,000. It's booting. hey look at that you can't see anything okay look at this i know it's far away and the color temperature just changed and it looks garish but look we booted it works we have a cd-rom drive matter of fact what can we do we can uh test it with a cd disc remember this that made an appearance earlier go ahead and press the old open button and we should see any second now uh, an icon on the desktop or the workbench, the desktop queue. How dare you? Hey, look at that. Image effects install. And what do you see up here in the corner? Ha <laughs> ha! 413 megabytes of RAM. Dear God, what's wrong with this man? You know what's cool? We can click on this guy here, go up here, icons, eject disk, and out she comes. You know, it can't be called the Always Boot 4000 until I put the case back on and put this all back together and make it look pretty again. And then we'll fire up Lightwave and see if we can get that Voyager loaded. All right, I felt I was bringing great shame to the Videoscape 3D box, so kind of gone to this new arrangement with these uh, Amiga OS 3.2 and ImageFX cases holding the monitor up. I know it's crooked. Sorry about that. I need to get a center stand monitor for this. I have one I recently bought at Office Depot for the Amiga 3000. I wanted to test it there first. They're only like 100 bucks. It has VGA and hdmi input it's center stand it has a 4x3 uh, 16x9 switch srgb color control it even has free sync for some reason and it's an ips panel looks gorgeous on the 3000 i'm going to go back tomorrow and get another one for the 4000 let's uh go ahead and see if she's the always boot uh 4000 right pushing the power button dun 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 all right so there we go cd-rom spinning up i'm seeing a black screen hard drive's doing what it's supposed to do it's going to hunt the bus there for a second and figure out what the heck is going on uh, mr amiga here but you're going to see it start booting i'm pretty oh there it goes it's booting 
I think we've got an Always Boot 4000 companion to our Always Boot 3000. Look at this. Look at this. So we're going to go ahead and fire up my network share. No. Now, through no fault of the Amiga 4000, occasionally my uh, Amiga share doesn't come up right away. You have to reboot. So here we are again, booted back up. Going to try and get that SMB2 share to work. Again, I, I let you folks see everything. And by the way, we can just go to eyebrows right now and see if it's online to proving that the uh, network card is actually working. Oh, I need to update this eyebrows. So, yep, we have internet. Look at that. So let's try and activate this share again. There we go. See how it comes up again. Sometimes you just have to do it twice. So now we can fire up Lightwave. We'll go to load scene. Let's see if we can grab the Voyager. Oh, yes. Load, open, here we go. So what you're about to see is the original digital production model used in the Star Trek television show Voyager back in the, uh, oh gosh, I guess what, the mid, mid to late 90s? Early, yeah, mid to late 90s, really. That's where, it, I think that's where that show existed. I worked on that show for about a season and a half, maybe two seasons in total. And it, a lot of great history with that show. I know a lot of you folks out there who watch this channel like Star Trek. And I just thought it'd be such a treat to try and get that model, which no, did not exist on the Amiga ever. It was, that came later when we got Windows PCs. So there is no original Amiga Voyager model. This is the Windows era model that I painstakingly converted to get to work into the Amiga, even with all this expanded memory. But the important thing is there's so many other things involved, point count, polygon counts, image sizes, but I've gotten it pretty much one-to-one -one as it was uh, on the show. This is as authentic, I think, as I can try and get it. Now, it's not gonna render correctly, and the reason I'm talking like this for so long is because you'll see the busy, because it's loading forever. There's gonna be some issues with the lighting we're gonna have to fix, I'm, I'm gonna have to fix. I'm not gonna do that in this video because this video is already getting really long. That'll be another video, like exploring lighting in Lightwave with the Voyager model. But I just wanna show it in here, kind of wrap this video up. The Always Boot 4000 doing its thing. My God, will it ever load? Please load. For the love of the load, load. Yeah, this is a uh, very large asset, as I was saying, and it takes a long time to load. I apologize, but uh, just cutting in here, I'm gonna, of course, chop this all up and edit, but wanted to say that, yeah, this thing takes a long time to load over even the 100 megabit or 10 megabit um, you know, network card I've gotten here. It's coming off that. Now, obviously, if I put this on an internal hard drive, you know, a boosted you know, controller, a SCSI or something, it'd be a lot quicker. But remember, all of my Amigas share a network connection on, and a share, and they all pull their data in so that whenever I go to each Amiga, I'm dealing with the same content when it comes to like Lightwave and other stuff. There we go, she's finally loaded. As I said, it does take quite a while over the network because this is a massive object, and there we have it. You're seeing the Voyager in all of its glory, the original production Voyager. And if we go to images here, yeah, we've got uh, only 22 megs used, but when you hit the old F9 button, it does expand into memory and it starts sucking down memory very, very quickly. But some of these images, as you can see, they're 1280 by 232, all kinds of sizes here. Eight, I mean, these are massive for you know, Amiga era stuff. You can load most Amiga original assets and Lightwave up and they use like 240 by 180 or something. So some of these are pretty, pretty huge. V top here, look at this, 1031 by 2489. All right, that's on an, this is massive for an Amiga. Now our camera is set to some custom stuff here, 720 by 486, which is the old NTSC D1. We're set to 8-bit ham. Let's go ahead and press F9. I'm sure this is gonna look ridiculous. Uh, I say ridiculous because the lighting, all the little spotlights and self-illumination on the ship, uh, the PC version of Lightwave handles all that very differently. So this is probably gonna look really blown out and extra colorful and kind of the clown Voyager, but let's see. Here we are, we're finally in the rendering phase. Look at this, look at it go. And I'm not gonna do any anti-aliasing, so it's gonna look a little jaggy when it finally throws up there. But you know what? For D1 resolution, which was the resolution that this was rendered back in the day when it was on television, that's that's really good. I mean, this 50 megahertz 6860, I always said it really does kind of compare to the old Pentium Pros that we were using back then. The Pentium Pro, uh, I think 120 or something, 120 megahertz, or 120 megahertz. Uh, Pentium Pro 120 was the model, I believe. Maybe Pentium Pro 200. Uh, they're very, I mean, the render speeds were very similar, actually, uh, for this. And that's what's so impressive about the 60 out of 60, even at 50 megahertz. 
And there we go, as I promised, the clown colored Voyager original production model. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah, so what's happening here is all the little, like I said, the little lights that, uh, little point lights, these little tiny lights that kind of cast light onto the ship, all of their uh, fall off values, their, how the light gets dimmer and dimmer the further it gets from the source of the light, all those values are completely out of whack right now. So yeah, we've just got this wonderful looking clown Voyager, right? So there it is, looking all beautiful and pretty, the original Voyager loaded on this 4000 thanks to the awesome power of that uh, gotta go fast Ram expansion card and Kazanov 64 thanks again for putting that together. Chris Edwards, again, thank you for figuring out the IDE cable issue. So now we have a nice uh, CD-ROM drive and my hard drive, everything's working. And we have an Always Boots Amiga 4000 to go along with the Always Boots Amiga 3000. Thanks for watching. Eh, you know, I'm done with this video.